I know you've probably heard that song before, and if you hadn't, I'm gonna off-key sing it to you, okay? I'm cheap. I'm not buying music. <laughs> okay, and it goes like this, and it says, And when I fight, I will fight on my knees. Something my hands lifted high. There it is. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. When you go pray, how do you do it? Are, are you crying? Are you pleading? Are you, what is it? It's like begging. There was a time in my life when it looked like begging. Like begging, pleading. And listen, there are times that we need to approach God in that way. In that we need to understand how broken we are in that moment so that our weakness can meet his strength. Because when you're depleted of you is when God can really move. So don't think that I'm telling you that you've been getting it wrong. But in some cases, you probably have and I have too. So Hebrews 4.16 says it like this. It says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Lots of translations say it like this and I prefer it. It says, so let us come boldly to the throne of a gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. A way that I've learned to pray really pisses the enemy off. Yes, I'm cussing. Pisses the enemy off because, I mean, let's just be real, okay? And the reason that the enemy comes at you is already because, A, you're God's child. B, God loves you. And for whatever reason, the devil can't stand that. And if you're God's child and the enemy's mad because you're God's child and because God loves you, all right, then why would you approach the throne room as anything else but a child? Let me say it like this. My, my kids don't play, all right? And when my kids come to me, even if they know that it's extravagant or even if they know that it seems somehow impossible. They don't approach me like that. It's just, I need this, or I want this. And God wants us to approach that way too. I've always loved that about my kids, that they don't approach me with the typical approach of a child. It's just they expect me to want to be good to them. They expect that if I got it, they got it. They just live in expectancy that it's just, we got it. There were times that we didn't got it, but they believed that we had it. But God is completely the opposite. God always has it. And I need you to always remember, if God has it, you have it. The Bible says it like this. It says, your father owns the cattle on a thousand hill. And I'm from a dairy farm, so that always spoke to me. A thousand hill of cattle is very expensive. A thousand heel of cattle, uh, depending on how you think about cows, they're pets to me, all right? And I'm just looking at a whole lot of cows to love. But it also is a sign of provision, right? You know, not only can you get milk from cows, you can get cheese from cows, you can get meat from cows if you, you know, eat meat. And anyway, just so on and so forth. And if you're like me, cows symbolize home for you. Cows might symbolize to me just the epitome of home and, and love and knowing that at the end of the day, when I need something or I desire to feel comforted, I want to be where I grew up. God is all of these things. There's provision in God. If your father has it, you have it. So why would you go to the throne room like, please God, just if you love me, if you care, if you, it's, I mean, I hate to put it like this, and it's the only way I can think of it, though. It's such a Phar Pharisee type of mindset. Such an overly religious mindset, right? To think that God doesn't want to bless you, so you have to plead. That's not what he tells us. It's so clear that not only does he sympathize with us, because we're also told that we have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, who is not unable to sympathize with our weakness. 
We have one who was tempted in every way yet did not sin. So let us approach the throne with confidence. And I love that. Why? 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 Why do you think about it? I mean, I'm not masking you honestly. And I mean, I have to get honest with myself a lot. When I think of reasons I thought God wouldn't show up for me, it never had anything to do with God. It always had to do with people. People's um, projection of who God was. People's um, list of how you had to be for God to answer your prayers. So on and so forth. It's religious. It's trinkety. It's nonsense. And Jesus said none of those things. He said, come unto me. Whosoever. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. Let us approach it boldly. And I'm going to teach you how to do that. Okay. It looks like this. So when I pray, this is how I pray. I pray like this. God, I know that you want to bless me. I live in expectancy of you. I expect good things from you. Thank you that I can expect good things from you. I thank you that it's already done. I thank you that I am favored. I thank you that I am blessed. I thank you that I'm safe. I thank you that I am healthy. I thank you that if you got it, I got it. And my daddy don't let me lose. And I know you're not going to let me lose. In Jesus' name, I thank you that I am already victorious. This is how I pray. This is how I pray. I pour my heart out to God, and that is conversation. But when I pray, I pray like this. Because I believe that there is so much power in that. There's a story of Daniel, and Daniel was not getting the miracle that he wanted. Daniel had fasted and prayed, and Daniel's prayers moved heaven, right? He was frustrated. But God comes and sends an angel to talk to Daniel. And he tells Daniel basically like this. Daniel, I've had it ready forever, but the warfare in the air blocked the warring of the good and the evil. And I know that sounds very cliche, but the Bible says that we don't wrestle with things that we see. We wrestle with things that we can't. Look at the world and the state of it, all right? The nonsense. Everybody's on their bullshit. Sorry, but I mean, they really are. I mean, look at the war. Look at people not really caring about each other when they were shortages of things, like fighting over the toilet paper. Listen, I grew up on the farm. I got leaves. Y'all can have toilet paper. I'm Gucci, all right? You've got to get to a space where if the world looks that crazy, what do you think the spiritual realm looks like? Why do you think that the world's crazy? God already has your answer, and he's already got your blessing, and he's already got all the things that you want. And he told Daniel that it was his prayers that created this break in the clouds. It was his prayers that created this break in this spiritual space. Almost like when Moses parted the sea, Daniel parted the spiritual atmosphere. And down came the answer. And if, if that's true, if Daniel approached boldly, because it takes a boldness to go into that. It takes a boldness to know that your prayers can change the atmosphere because they can and God doesn't just change an atmosphere for me or for other people or for ministry people. Or God will change the atmosphere for whosoever. So my question to you is, what is it that made you stop asking God like you could expect? What was it? And, and what place did you place that can't on God? All the places I can trace mine to when I felt that way was to people. I didn't trust people. Therefore, I had a lesser trust in God at a time in my life. But when I stopped putting any faith in people, I mean, that sounds crazy, right? People are going to fail you. I will fail you. People will fail you. God will not fail you. And you won't need me forever. You won't need other people forever. God desires for you to learn so that you can go and you can take it up directly with him. He loves you like that. You don't have to come to somebody like me for the answer. God has your answer. And I know that sounds crazy, right? To put yourself out of business. I'm in the business of putting myself out of business because I'm about the father's business, right? 
So if I'm focused on teaching you so that you can go and do it in your own life and you can teach somebody else, that's how we create a kingdom mentality. And that's how we go to war together. So I hope that you put this into practice. I do. You're never going to see me fancily set up. That's not me. <laughs> Listen, I go to God the way I am. I'm going to come to you the way that I am. Sometimes that's over the top and sometimes that's, listen, I'm ready to go to bed. But I know that I know that if God has it, you got it. Just like my kids know if I've got it, they've got it. And they know that behind the, if I've got it, they've got it, is because mama believes that if God has it, I got it. And if I got it, they got it. All right. So tonight, I impart on you what I have. If God's got it, I got it. And if I got it, you got it. If I can expect good from God, so can you. I pray that you grow to the go to the throne room boldly. Quit going in there like a wiener. Mama didn't raise no, okay? Didn't. Didn't. Your life's been too hard for you to go in there. Like a like you're begging. Like a beggar. You were not an orphan. God loves you. You're his child. Whether you're just coming to God, whether you're still trying to decide how you feel, God loves you. He's already chose you. And you know that in the end you'll choose him anyway. And he knows. He knows. Go to the throne room boldly. That's what I challenge you to do. Go to the throne room boldly. It makes the enemy mad. And when he gets mad and starts showing himself in your life, I want you to do it more. And then do it more. Because the key to your warfare is that when you get knocked down, you get back up. Though a righteous man falls many times, he will get up more times than he falls. You've got this. And I don't want the, the term righteous man to throw you off. I don't want that to throw you off. You love God. God loves you. Righteous man. And even though we become more like God over time, don't ever let anybody tell you that you're less than. Or that your life has led you to a space where you can't go like other people can. Or even if you've known God for one second, that you don't have the same type of authority that anybody else does because that's religion and that's a law go to the throne room boldly and watch god show out watch him do it out loud makes the enemy mad and at the end of the day your job is not to please people and your job is not to please the enemy god loves when he's mad god loves it he does not desire that you fear the enemy you should never fear the enemy do you not understand it yet? Have you, do you not see? The enemy is terrified of you. Why are you terrified of him? Become the aggressor. And this is a great way to start. Become the aggressor in your spiritual warfare because you're going to have it whether you ask for it or not. So if you wouldn't go into a real fight, because I wouldn't, listen, I'm from the wrong side of the tracks and I may be little, but if we fight and one of us is going down and we're not going to stop till one of us is blacked out. You know what I'm saying? I want you to fight like that in the spirit. If you used to fight like that in the physical, this is easy. This is easy. This is easy. And God is calling out the dark horses like you, like me, who come from another side of the kingdom. You know what I mean? We're from the south side of the kingdom. That's all right. It's okay. God needs that. We are made for war, and I don't want that to scare you. But look at everything you've been through in your life. Hard, right? You could probably tell me stories. I could tell you stories. But because we have that history, we've seen it all, and yet we're here. What does that tell you? That God has sustained you, and that God has protected you. And if God be for you, who could be against you? So why are you not going about things like you are a child of God? And there is not anything more bad than being a child of God. 
if you look back in the Bible and you look back at times they chose violence because it wasn't always just, hey, we go. Deborah wasn't playing. Deborah was not playing, okay? When, when Deborah was leading the army, right? Come on now, got a woman, got a woman going to war and in charge of everybody. But Deborah was also a prophet and when she went, she had hired a general, right? And this general is scared. He's like, I'm not going down there without you. And what was happening in her home at that time, and this was her home. This was, She was protective of this place. They couldn't even go down and trade, and that's how they made money off of these roads that they were in because everybody had infiltrated it, and they were terrified. But Deborah wasn't. Deborah was like, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, sir. No, ma'am. And when Deborah said she would go with the generals, she said, I'll go with you. But I promise you that the enemy will be delivered to us by a woman. And this is where we got Jael. And if you don't know about Jael, that's my best friend. She a real bad. That, that was Jael. Not only did Jael go down like she was helpful to him. She was there to watch over the tent. She was like, sir, I got you. I'm gonna watch your tent. Gonna wash your tent, watch it, gonna watch it. But do you know what she did when he went to sleep? She could have just killed him and knocked him in the head with this tent stake. No, ma'am, they were all done, right? Breaking point of spiritual warfare. She was done. They were all done. So JL takes the tent stake and drives it through his temple and literally nails him to the ground. Hello? And you're going in there like, please? Go in there like jail. Go in there. And when you go into spiritual warfare, I don't mean hurt people. Don't ever hurt people. When you go into the spiritual realm, you got to choose violence in the spirit. I know that sounds crazy, right? But choosing violence in the spirit means something completely different than in the physical. Choosing violence means that you speak life. Choosing violence means that you don't let the enemy win. Choosing violence means no matter how many times you get knocked down, you get back up, you dust yourself off because you're a warrior and you're not going to let anybody do you that way. And I don't mean anybody, but any spirit. You're not going to let any spirit come through and ruin what God's trying to do. You bless people. You go about your day, okay, you don't like me, that's all right, God bless you. Go about your day and then you handle it in the spirit with prayers like this. And I don't mean you handle the people. So we don't ever deal with the people. We deal with the spirit of whatever's working through that person. So if somebody's slandering you, don't go in and ask God to do terrible things because he's not going to listen to you, okay? <laughs> that's crazy. When you go in there, you begin to rebuke the spirit of slander and rebuke X, Y, Z. And you go into the throne room boldly. Pray for them. Pray good things over them. That makes the enemy mad too. Bold prayers, dangerous prayers never look like what you think they should look like. Now I'm going to bed. And I'm going to pray my prayers like I always do, like this. And I hope that you're doing the same. You got this, and you're just as good as anybody else. Repeat it with me. I'm just as good as anybody else. And if my daddy's got it, say it. If my daddy's got it, I got it. You got it? Good. <laughs>